Sadhguru. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here with us today. On behalf of the Economic Times, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the latest edition of ET Conversations, our initiative to create awareness with the economic, social, on sustainability. We all get embroiled in our immediate challenges, issues like the pandemic, the looming recession, the Ukraine war, the growing social unrest occupy the top of our mind. But there's a larger crisis looming ahead of us. The very sustainability of our planet for the future generations is at stake. While there's awareness on climate change, environmental degradation, and global warming, this only form a small part of the larger picture. The Save the Soil initiative being championed by Sadhguru, as we saw in the video just now, and Isha Foundation has brought the issue to light and shall have a profound impact on generations to come. It takes a spiritual master like Sadhguru. Sadhguru, I did hear the video yesterday also. But it takes a spiritual master like you to take us to the realm of a longer term sustainability of the soil, the very source of our nutrition, our survival. The UN data shows that the human damage to the soil is accelerating with up to 40% now classified as degraded soil. Where are we going to find food to feed and sustain the 8.5 billion population if forecast by 2030? The Economic Times has always spotlighted India Inc.'s most pressing challenges. Times of India through its Evoke initiative has created awareness around environment and sustainability. Today we are privileged to have Sadhguru himself, who is championing the cause of Save the Soil. Sadhguru is the founder of the Isha Foundation, has touched the lives of millions, actually I should say billions now with the Save the Soil Foundation, Save the Soil Initiative around the world over the transformational programs. Over the years, he has also launched several path-breaking initiatives like educational, health and community revitalization efforts like Rally for Rivers, Project Green Hands, Action for Rural Rejuvenation and Kaveri Calling. Currently, the mistake is on a 100-day, 30,000-kilometer solar motorcycle journey. Today, also, he came in motorcycle, if any of you want to know. 27 countries to promote the soil conservation movement. The driving belief behind the initiative is soil is not a resource. It is the very source of our life. Arundhati Bhattacharya, the chairperson and CEO of Salesforce in India, and the first woman to be the chairperson of State Bank of India has kindly consented to lead the discussions this evening. She is the chairperson of SWIFT India and sits on the Reliance Industry Board. On behalf of the Economic Times and the Times of India Group, we are privileged to welcome Sadhguru and Arundhati. I want, once again thank, like to thank everyone present here on the conf confidence report in the Economic Times, the most read business daily in India, and also the fourth largest English newspaper. Thank you, and over to our distinguished speakers. Thank you. <laughs> oops, oops, oops. <laughs> Namaste, good evening everybody and uh, thank you very much and Sadhguru, uh, my uh, real respect and uh, Pranam to you for all that you have been doing. Uh, to just kick off the discussions for today, I think let's go to the primary basic question, which is, you know, if you look at corporates around the world, if you look at individuals around the world, a lot of people talk about climate change, they talk about global warming, they talk about air quality, they talk about lack of drinking water, they talk about a lot of things. But, you know, nobody has really latched on to the concept of soil. So what led you to it and why soil? Why do you think it's the primary cause for which you led such a huge movement? Uh, namaskaram to everyone. Good evening. <coughs> I've been talking about soil for thirty years now and… Do uh, you need this? No, I have a beard now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Uh, for the last thirty years I've been talking about soil 
I've spoken to ministers, I've spoken to heads of state, I've spoken to various bureaucrats, responsible people in the society. Everybody says, Dhadguru, this is fantastic, we never knew this is great and they'll sleep on it. So, uh, I've been wondering what is it that takes for people to wake up really? And uh, as I speak to various agricultural ministries around the world, I found that everybody knows the problem. All the soil scientists know the problem, most agricultural ministries in the major nations know the problem and they also know the general direction of the solution where we should go. So I realized they know the problem, they know the solution, they are waiting for an idiot to bell the cat. <laughs> so here I am. Because it's always the tradition in our country and everywhere to bell the cat, to do something dangerous, mm -hmm. to do something that could uh, make you like an idiot. You always choose a village idiot to do it. <laughs> so I'm somebody who's got nothing to lose, I have no election to win, I have no money to make, I have no salary to receive from anybody. So I thought I could do what I want and what is needed because you must understand even in large conventions where the entire world sits together. Just in January we had a large convention. Yes. I've spoken to many environment ministers who attended this convention for two weeks and they said, Sadhguru, we were there for two weeks, we did not hear the word soil, why? I said, you must ask that question because I don't want to get into the politics of why, because I need those people also for Safe Soil Movement, mm. so I am not willing to divide those who have consciously avoided this. But you talked about water, air, there are many ways to put this into context, but considering the time, let me put it this way. Every scientist who studies this aspect knows this, that approximately a billion years ago, some one very smart algae or a fungi came up with an idea of wanting to cook their food mm -hmm. using the perpetual energy of the sun. That phenomenon today we call as photosynthesis. Before the phenomenon of photosynthesis started, the atmospheric oxygen was a shade over one percent. Today it is twenty-one percent. This twenty-one percent oxygen is not only keeping us alive right now, he helping us to breathe, it is the basis of our evolution. Complex life on this planet happened only as oxygen levels in the atmosphere went on increasing and that is a consequence of photosynthesis. But in the last thousand years, we have removed eighty-five percent of the photosynthesis on the planet. What's our plan really? So how do I know this? What am I? Am I a soil scientist? Am I an environmentalist, ecologist? None of this. I am like a worm on this planet. I live on this planet, I crawl on this planet. Six and a half decades I've been crawling around on this planet, feeling it. Isn't everybody doing it? No. They have built their own worlds in their head. I didn't build any of my own, so I live on this planet. Others live in their psychological spaces, they have built their own individual world. Uh, in… in your group, I'm sure it's fashionable to say corporate world. So you have a different world. I live on this world. I think it's time everybody lives on this world because this is the only damn world we have to really live, if you want to live. Uh, so Sadhguru, I agree, you know, that the basis of life, as you say, it's this world and this soil, this earth that we are talking about. Uh, we, in the Eastern philosophy, we talk about the Panchabhuta and obviously the earth is very much part of that. So just talking about air and water doesn't cut it, ultimately it comes down to the soil. No, water and air are products of soil. Right. Without rich soil, none of these things will be available, be available. the way we know it. Right. And I think you said somewhere also as to the amount of water that can be retained in soil, Means it's besides the rivers and ponds and lakes, you know, the mere capacity of soil to hold water. You talked about that somewhere as well, I think. See, uh, the water, mm -hmm. excess water should go into ponds and rivers, but the water should be generally in the soil. So water should be… I mean, soil should be moist always. Only then the microbial activity is at its full scale. When we say microbial activity, we are not talking about some creatures, 
we are talking about the source of our life. Sixty percent of our bodies today are still microbes, only forty percent is genetic material. Sixty percent are microbes here and the same is true with the soil. So what is happening in the soil? This fifteen to eighteen inches of topsoil is a magical material which has generated every other creature on this planet. Whatever you've seen as life, whether it's a worm or an insect or a bird or a tree or an animal or human beings, every one of them are a product of the life that is happening within fifteen to eighteen inches of topsoil. To create one inch of topsoil, it would take six hundred to eight hundred years, that is if there was no human footprint. Today with the present level of human footprint, to create one inch of soil, it would take thirteen thousand years. But nearly fifty percent of the soil, topsoil is gone. And uh, which reminds me, Sadhguru, you know of one of the experiences I had when I was in my earlier organization and uh, I was looking at some cane farmers. And these cane farmers, what they would do is in the night they would switch on the pumps and go to bed. And in the morning they'd switch off the pumps. And in the meanwhile the whole place would be flooded. So they were doing what is called flood irrigation. But as a result of it, much of the topsoil was getting drained out into the ponds, etc., along with the fertilizers and things. The ponds were silting up, the topsoil was eroding, and they were using more and more fertilizers. These fertilizers going into the ponds, in turn, were creating more weeds and things like that and silting it up. And therefore, the water, the capacity, the retention capacity of those water bodies was going down, the topsoil was going, and yet, you know, they had no understanding of what they were doing. And that is my question, that you know, when we are talking about soil, you are creating this awareness all around. But if you look at the poor farmers today in India, they have these very small holdings and they want to maximize their production. So they use resources which they feel will give them better production because they need more income. So how is it that we are going to raise the awareness of such people? who, you know, are really dependent on the soil and who feel that the only way of getting more out of it is using practices which are not really the right kind of practices. How do we bring about that awareness in all of them? When it comes to the farmer, preaching and teaching is of no use because farm economy is so fragile, if you just touch it, it'll collapse, it's in that kind of condition. Mm. You've obviously heard about the suicides, people are disputing the numbers. Is it three hundred thousand, is it two fifty thousand? We must be ashamed. Whether it's quarter million or three hundred thousand is a big debate going on. Even if it's hundred thousand people, even if it's one man committed suicide because of soil degradation, that he's not able to farm the way he wants, we must be looking up how to change this. So, there is no point preaching and teaching the farmer. The whole economic policy that we have done, we have prepared hundred and ninety-three documents which are handbooks for making policy for one hundred and ninety-three nations, unique documents. Mm. Okay. Depending upon the latitudinal position, mm. the soil type, the economic condition of a given nation and its agricultural traditions. Mm -hmm. Why agricultural traditions are important is even if you have all the science with you, still you cannot change the agricultural practices overnight, which is what okay. you're talking about. Yeah. So, the important thing is it has to be incentive-driven. Mm -hmm. When I say incentive-driven, can I take a minute or two? Yes, please? of course, of course, <laughs> take as much time. <laughs> we want to hear your ideas, that's the main thing. When I say incentive-driven, see right now, in the… in the marketplace, people are talking about organic food. This is a word coined by urban populations who do not know one thing from the other when it comes to farming. I'm sorry I'm speaking like this, but this is a fact because people are saying farmers should do organic farming. You don't know what farming is. I want you to understand if you remove all the pesticides and fertilizer from the world today, tomorrow our food production will be twenty-five percent of what it is and that will be the worst disaster you will unfold in the world. So it's very important to understand that farmer doesn't enjoy throwing fertilizer like this as people are imagining. Fertilizer is very expensive, every handful that he throws, it hurts him because it's cost him a lot of money. He's throwing it because soil is in that condition, if you do not put that much fertilizer, nothing will come out of it. 
the practice that you said of, uh, you know, uh, flood irrigation, flood irrigation has essentially come to us because of canal irrigation where the government says you will get only three hours of water. So he wants to get all the water he can get and he's also dug one open well next to his field so that his well also fills up. He doesn't want to lose out the water, three hours of water, whatever he can get, he wants to get, which will cause a lot of damage to the soil, of course. But you must understand his condition, because once in fifteen days or once in a month, three hours, four hours, when the canal opens up for him, he wants all of it, all that he can get. It is like a hungry child trying to eat up three meals in one meal when he's starved out, when he's not sure when the next meal is coming. This is the condition of the farmer. So, the important thing is there has to be an incentive. Right now, the… the… you know, the shameful thing in the world is not a single nation, not even one nation on the planet has the minimum three percent organic content. UN goes about to say, if you want to call soil a soil, there must be three percent organic content, otherwise it's becoming sand. But not a single nation has that. The highest the average that you have in the world right now is Northern Europe, which is 1.48 percent. Southern Europe is 1.1 percent. United States of America is 1.25 percent. India is 0.68 percent. Africa as a continent average is 0.3 percent. In the last twenty-five years, ten percent of the world's land has turned into deserts, ten percent in twenty-five years. So this is where we are going. So what is the solution? Because fifty-four percent of the world's arable land is farmed and another eighteen to twenty percent is marginally or partly farmed, nearly seventy-one percent of the land is under plough. Another four-point-two percent is paved because of urban developments. Mm -hmm. So totally seventy-six percent of the land is either ploughed or paved. So where is the photosynthesis? <laughs> just look at our lands, look at our farms. What do you see? You just see brown soil and machines. Do you see any vegetation? Do you see any animals? No. There are only two sources of organic content in the world, not only in the world, in the known universe plant life and animal life, there is simply no other way. There is no other way that you can bring organic content from somewhere else. It is only plant life and animal life. Both have disappeared from the farms. If you farm like this in twenty-five to thirty years, your soil, however rich it was, it will be degenerated, that's what has happened. Now we need to set up an incentive. This is what we are pushing for with all the governments. Whatever the percentage is right now, if you get it to three percent, you will get a certain incentive. If you make the incentive attractive enough, most farmers will go for it. In a country like India, eighty-four point two percent of the farmers are small and marginal farmers, that means below five acres of land. But they cover only forty-seven point six percent of the land area. But these are easy or low-hanging fruits because they were willing to do it for small incentives. Even a small incentive is a big incentive for him. So we could go that way, how the government makes its policy is left to that. But I'm just saying, one thing is the incentive to get them there. Next thing is in the hands of all of you, the corporate uh, world in the world. Can I call you that? <laughs> corporate world in the world. <laughs> so there is something called as carbon credit market. Last seven years we've been trying hard to get some kind of carbon credit benefits to our farmers, it's an impossible maze. Just not able to get across. We have not uh, had an inch of success because it looks like the whole thing is designed for industry. The same template is being imposed upon the farmer. There is no way we can get that. So we are pushing with the central government in India and also some of the world bodies that you must make the carbon credit scheme for the farmers very simple not in the usual measurable way as it's with the industry. With the industry you can measure. With land, how much carbon dioxide it emits when it's in a condi certain condition or methane it emits or how much it sequesters, it is different from moment to moment or at least minute to minute. Early morning if you go there, when the sun is just coming up, it'll be one way. After two hours, it'll be different way. If it's a humid day, it'll be one way. If it's a dry day, it'll be another way. Nobody can ever measure it exactly. But we can arrive at a common number that if somebody has minimum three percent organic content, 
he will get so much carbon credit because generally we know how much a certain type of land would sequester. So if you put up a such a number, then for today there is discussion in the UN and also in the economic forum about fixing somewhere between ten, twenty-eight dollars to hundred dollars for per acre. If that kind of benefit comes to the farmer, definitely the second level of incentive will work. The third level of incentive again could come down to you, all of you, is that the market should recognize this. Right now, if you go to the marketplace, they're saying this mango is organic. What is the other one? Is it inorganic? Hello? <laughs> is the other one inorganic? Is there such a thing? Now people are talking about no a certain amount of fertilizer, pesticide went to it. This is all false. When did a farmer apply the pesticide? When it was flowering, when it was fruiting or after it is fruited? What has he done? Which time has he done? All this will decide how much has actually gotten into it or not gotten into it. The same goes for fertilizer. When did he apply the fertilizer? So these things to measure in a given mango or a vegetable or a fruit or whatever is a very complex lab affair. This is why it is very important we just measure the organic content. If you measure the organic content, the measurement can happen on the farm in ten, fifteen minutes time. This is very important, otherwise if you make lab process compulsory or requirement mandatory, then as in courts we have some 1.2 crore cases waiting. Many of you in businesses, you must know you have cases which are twenty-five years old and uh, <laughs> every day you have to push it and it doesn't go anywhere. The same will happen th with this, whatever kind of lab infrastructure you build, you will end up with a backlog that you cannot clear. So it's important that it is settled on the farm. It can be done like this, there are simple instruments with which if you put a solvent, f you can… through the video, I'm saying online, you can make the farmer say, okay, take this sample, take that sample, ten different places in your land, Re measure in front of me. If you measure there, right there in ten minutes you can certify, okay, this has three percent organic content. If you do this only, then incentives will mean something, otherwise in incentives will end up in the backlog. Absolutely. So in the marketplace, if this mango is coming from three percent organic content, we already have enough science to tell us how much micronutrients are present in this three percent organic field mango. So what are the health benefits? What are the preventive health benefits? What are the benefits in terms of, uh, you know, lack of l loss of ma mandates? What is the benefit in terms of health and uh, creativity of the human beings? And how the state will benefit by reducing the stress and the healthcare system. There are many things, all this data is there, we can put across all that. So if it is three percent, if it is one percent, you are paying, let's say, ten rupees. If it is a three percent organic content farm, you are paying maybe twelve rupees or fifteen rupees. If it is six percent, maybe you are paying twenty rupees. But instead of eating six or twelve mangoes, you can eat one mango and it fulfills your nourishment requirement. And one important thing that will happen is, once the micronutrient level is higher in the food, the volume of food that you feel like eating will come down significantly. Mm -hmm. Sadhguru, frankly speaking, you know, it's a fantastic idea regarding carbon credit for farmers, something at least I had never thought of at all because the idea of carbon credits itself <laughs> is so complex and to actually employ it like, you know, you… the way you described it, it's almost like, you know, the people who supply milk to the Amul depots. You know, you come, put it in the machine, it. it ascertains the contents and it immediately credits the money into your account. So if something like that I, could I work… I was in Banas, yeah. you know, on, on the way I was in Banas where mm -hmm. this is a super success. Mm -hmm. Probably this is one of the most successful cooperative movements in the world. Mm -hmm. The way the life in that desolate land has changed for people. Mm. This needs to happen everywhere. Right. We are running FPOs in right. southern right. India, twenty-three FPOs. We are running one of our FPO, FPO has been awarded as the best FPO in the country. Mm -hmm. And incomes have gone up. Yep. In the last twenty-seven years, we have worked with f about 1.3 lakh farmers. Incomes have gone up anywhere between three hundred to eight hundred percent. Right. Because soil has to be rich, this is very important. And the important thing about soil is, nobody is in disagreement. Till now I have not met one person who says, no, it's not necessary. Whether it is oil industry, coal industry, automobile industry, whatever industry you're running, fertilizer industry, doesn't matter who. 
rich soil, is it good for you? Everybody says yes. So when you have such a thing, one important thing that I'm pushing for in the world bodies and also in the Indian government and the state governments is to address soil separately from other environmental concerns. If you mix it up with that, this will go into endless debate. Decades of debate has been happening, not moving anywhere because always environmentalist means he is trying to hit some industry. This has become the norm. Go out on the street and scream against this person or that person and say, pull down this industry, shut down that industry. Industries are not built overnight. It cannot be shut down overnight. If at all, if wrong things are happening, when I say wrong things, we have done… out of ignorance, we have done certain things. If you want to correct, if you want to transform the industry, certain amount of time and a certain incentive has to be offered. Otherwise, it will not happen. If you're practical, if you want a solution, if you just like debate, if you like conferences, that's a different matter. Because a whole lot of people are thriving on conferences, this is what I see. <laughs> really, they just like to go to conferences, their profession is to be in the conferences. <laughs> uh, so Sadhguru, you know, you talked about all the corporates and you know, there are a number of corporates here. I personally am part of the corporate sector as well. Uh, you know, it's true that there is a lot of awareness amongst corporates. So policies are in place, budgets are in place, processes are in place. But the big problem I think is that we are still struggling to make this a part of our core functions. How do you ensure that this awareness of sustainability or whatever we are talking about in respect of helping the environment or ensuring that we have a better environment, how do you make it part of your core functions? I think that's where corporates struggle. How do you, means what would be your suggestion as to how we can get that done? Uh, what I say is very unpopular. <laughs> the more unpopular, I, the better, so I, please. I already ahead. told you I'm not trying to win an election, so what's my problem? <laughs> <coughs> See, if a business is set up for certain purpose, their business is just to run that business for that purpose. It is not their business to start a school, it is not their business to start a hospital, it's not their business to save environment, I don't think so. It is in the policy that it has to be done that how businesses are done in this country without causing too much damage, that should be written into the policy. Mm -hmm. That means it's in the law book. Once it's in the law book, I think they will follow it. If they don't follow it, there will be a penalty. But it is not in the law and you say, why are you not building a hospital? India needs hospitals, India needs schools, why don't you build schools? Arrays, schools, hospitals must be done into another kind of business. We are expecting somebody else to do. When I spoke even against the two percent corporate social responsibility, I say, when I start the business, you tell me thirty percent is tax. Then if I start making money, you say you must pay two percent more because you have another responsibility. If I make more money, you will make another two percent more. Stop doing this because this is not good for the nation's business. Once you set the conditions, don't change the goalpost. No matter what, you change the policy in such a way that it is not about taxation, it is about making a more creative business. More, more uh, the very way we structure the business has to be, this is the question you're asking, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that is not in the hands of the business. Individual business people may do it, but tomorrow if the conditions in their business get little harsh, they will roll it back. Hello? Yeah. Yes or no? You, you need to do that to survive, you just… That's what I'm that saying. That point of time, survival See, is the main thing. I in the business, there are various challenges of their own. Every business, every institution has their own challenges. People who are outside will not understand this. Those who are running the stuff, they know what all challenges they have. So don't tell them to do all the service on the planet. Let them run their damn business well and that is the service. As long as they are paying the taxes, don't ask them anything more. I am saying those other things must happen in the policy and uh, if you want to raise taxes, it must be you know, whatever, once in ten or fifteen or twenty years when there is substantial time gap, then you, with consensus, you raise the tax if you wish. But I feel government will make much more money if it lowers the taxes than raises the taxes. <laughs> really. 
I'm sure, you know, a lot of the people over here should have actually clapped for that. <laughs> they probably aren't because they don't know who's listening. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter who's listening because this is a democratic nation. If people don't express, then all the time... See, why are we approaching the nation like this? Well, there may be some past experiences. Rest is all just fear syndrome, oh, they will do this, they will do that, it's not true. <laughs> Here and there such things have happened, sure. I'm not saying it's not happened. But rest is all just fear mongering going on, oh, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, nothing like that. Straightforward if you say, see, if you tax me ten percent, this is how much I pay because this is the kind of business I will do. If you make it five percent, I will, you know, multiply ten times over because I am competitive in the rest of the world True. and you will get this much money rather than that much money, I don't see why government will not come to its senses, it will. Sure. They have in fact reduced taxes, that's a fact. So let's see no, how I'm that works. No, I'm saying in a country like and India… we have not done too badly in spite of no, the No, in reductions. a country like India with the level of disparity we have, yes. we cannot eliminate taxes, we cannot True. go in that direction, True. not yet at least, mm. that is accepted. But I'm saying, business is an agile process. Bureaucracy is a, a sedate process, all right? If it has to be agile, people in the policy also must be dynamic enough all the time. So right now, agriculture, if you want to see it as a business, we need to do some things quickly which has serious ecological concerns. Every business, no matter what kind of business you're running, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, digging coal or you're running uh, electronic stuff, it has an ecological impact. Mm -hmm. More or less is a question mark, that's all. Everybody, as we're breathing, we have an ecological impact on everything around us. So every one of us are partners in this destruction. The only way around is every one of us become partners in the solution. There's simply no other way. If we have to become partners in this solution, this particular aspect, why I am focusing on agricultural soil? Because everybody, it's fashionable to talk about rainforests, because they have never seen one, most people. <laughs> With rainforests, you don't have to do anything. If you stay out of it, it's fine. <laughs> it doesn't need your management. It doesn't need environmentalists to go there and manage a rainforest. It has managed itself for a million years. It will manage itself for another million years without our help. If you stay out, it's fine. But agricultural soil is that piece of geography where every day human hand is tending to it. But this is in a horrific condition where not a single nation has the minimum organic content as an average. So if you can't fix that place where every day men and women are working upon it, you talking about rainforests and oceans is just a joke and it's just for conversational material. It is not looking for a solution. Uh, Sadhguru, you know the numbers that you gave regarding the organic content in the soil, obviously it's the poorer nations that have far less organic content from the numbers that you uh, said. And uh, you know, just looking at it from the other side, don't you think it's really unfair that you know these developed nations which actually are far greater users per capita of resources, and who have actually exploited a lot of the resources in order to get to that developed status without any thought of the environment at that point of time because the awareness wasn't there, that, you know, they are actually at a far better position than those nations which need to develop but which currently are most impacted. So, you know, in a way, don't you think that this is very unfair and that we need to do something about that as well? Because otherwise, you know, this this problem about, uh, you know, no, while we are Arundhati, talking about… Yes. Uh, come on, you've been uh, heading one of the biggest banks in the country <laughs> yeah. and now you're part of Salesforce. Do you expect the world to be fair? No, I don't expect it to be fair, but shouldn't we strive for it to be fair? So life is not fair. I agree with you. Not only the world, life is not fair. Life is fair, but world is not fair maybe. <laughs> but, but the thing is, you know, the thing is, you know, but the burden of now ensuring sustainability or ensuring that our ecosystem is better, the bigger burden is falling on the poorer nations. Now, how is it can, that we can make the, you know, more developed world understand that at the end of the day, it is one world. 
So something impacts us will impact them as well. It has to. And they are realizing that when, you know, because of the ah, Ukraine fight, they are not getting the wheat. So they are realizing that. But having said that, I still don't think, you know, they, they have internalized this or they really… No, they need not internalize it because they have solutions mm -hmm. for that. See, uh, Ukraine war. Right now, thirty percent of the wheat is coming either from Russia or from Ukraine. One country is being bombed, another is banned. Whichever way, both have stopped wheat. So, uh, I think bread prices in some of the European nations have gone up to seventy percent escalation. They will cry a little bit and eat still. But about six nations, six to seven nations are going into serious famine this year. Exactly. Already two nations are in famine condition. It's expected in the next four to six months, 350,000 children below six years of age will die in these countries. Because everybody is focused on looking at I Ukraine and the whole narrative is on Ukraine, who is going to care about these nations? So that's not happening. Last year, the World uh, Food Program spent nine billion dollars distributing food. This year, they want fifteen billion dollars. Next year, that is twenty-twenty-three, they want twenty-two billion dollars. How long will you go on distributing food like this? Food must grow where people are, otherwise it's not sustainable over a period of time. This is something that we've always known, there's nothing new about it, but this is happening. But about, they will also realize, no, no, you must understand when there are food shortages, when real food shortages happen in the world, whoever has the biggest guns will get the food. Those who don't have will not have food, it's as simple as that. So it is a very unfair world as you were saying, <laughs> there is no doubt about it. But uh, coming back, you know, to your trip… We have to learn to live in that, right? Yeah, I, I suppose so. I don't <laughs> think there is a way out. But probably, you know, what you were saying about ensuring that we ourselves do the best we can for ourselves, that is probably the way out means there is really no way out other than helping no, the your thing own is, self No, the to thing is this, extent. Ma, when we are talking about agriculture, there is a certain power in this. For example, India. We have a latitudinal spread from Kanyakumari to Himalayas. That's we have true. a latitudinal spread that we can literally grow just about anything you want. Anything that grows anywhere in the world, we can grow from Kanyakumari to Himalayas if you choose the right place to grow and the right kind of inputs. So when we have such a thing, and another thing we have which very few nations have is, or no nation has actually is, nearly sixty percent of the population know how to do farming. When I say know how to do farming, this is something that educated and uh, urban populations have ignored is… See, even you may be an MBA from the best university, I will give you ten acres of land, fertile land, you grow me five different types of crops and show me, you will fail utterly. You may be an MSc in agriculture, you still can't grow, believe me. Because farmer has certain intrinsic knowledge, which unfortunately we are not valuing because there is no degree to it, there is no PhD to it, but he knows things that others don't know. He knows intrinsically just by living there. So, when we have nearly sixty percent, of population still in farming, we'll have to reduce it a little bit, but still that knowledge is there and we have a latitudinal spread like this, we can grow things in that quality and quantity if we raise the organic content in our lands as it used to be at one time. The whole world will want to eat our food because one thing that most people may not be unaware of, uh, aware of is See, a handful of soil ev in a rich uh, land has anywhere between six to eight billion organisms. Especially in the Deccan Plateau and south, south of Deccan Plateau, the soil has… the number of species present is the highest in the world. We don't know for what reason, there is no scientific reason as to why this is so. A handful of soil can have fifty to seventy-five thousand species present in one handful of soil. So this is a soil which will respond mm -hmm. very, very quickly and it can grow food of that quality which the whole world will want to eat. 
we have that power, we have people in agriculture, we have the land, we can easily do this. It… Right. it takes a determined effort, it doesn't take any rocket science to do this, we know how to do it. It doesn't take enormous financial outlay to do this. All it takes is face in the right direction and a resolute action, not deviating here and there, just staying on. Why I'm insisting on this is, after Rally for Rivers policy handbook that we wrote became the official, uh, you know, recommended policy for all the twenty-eight states, only six states began to act upon it. Others, of course, they were waiting for a disaster. And disaster came in the wrong form, it came in the form of the virus or the pandemic. Because the pandemic came, all the six states who were doing this also suspended whatever they were doing because they have other things to do now. So like this we get diverted from basic things because soil is not just one more problem, it is an existential thing, it is of existential significance. Once the nation loses its soil, which we are on the verge of. If, uh, if you don't understand what I'm saying, next time you fly from Delhi to Chennai, every five minutes look out and see, the whole country looks like a brown desert. Except for Western Ghats and the northeastern part of the nation, the whole country is a brown desert. There is not a single cover crop anywhere during summer. Just fifty years ago, every farmer used to have cover crops on the land. Now there is no cover crop. If you plow the land and leave it open, these days the machines are plowing twelve to fifteen inches deep. If you plow it and leave it open, this is murder of the soil. The simple thing is you're all in industry, I don't know what all types of industries. We have to rapidly bring in robotics into agriculture because right now we are using massive machines which just rip off everything. If you leave robotic machines, they will do action in a specific way. Uh, doctoring the soil the way it needs to be done. Only if we do this, we can keep the soil the way we want and still feed not only 1.3 billion people, we can feed another two to three billion people on the planet. We have that much soil strength and that much agricultural knowledge because we have over 12,000 years of agricultural history in southern India. But 12,000 years we managed our soil in a fertile condition, but in last forty-five years, we're kind of turning it into a desert. So, a lot of things to think about. So, in order to change that particular strain of thought, <laughs> let's go to your trip. You know, I'm sure we are going to get a fantastic book out of it. <laughs> so, we look forward to it. But just as a preview of that, uh, you know, could you share with us three things during the trip that surprised you? Uh, three things that disappointed you? and three things that elated you. So if you could… Uh, What's your you know. next profession? You being a journalist <laughs> or something? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Don't tell me you're going to run Economic Times after oh, this. Oh no, I'm not at all. I'm sure they're never going to call me again if you say that. This is the last time. <laughs> well, I don't know how to say three things, three things. What, anyway, uh, one say, thing, you, you, can, you can choose, you know, something that surprised you, something that disappointed you and something that you really felt elated about. <laughs> I, I stay always elated. This I know is my, that, this yes, is my problem. I know that. <laughs> I'm always elated no matter what's happening <laughs> around me. <laughs> so, elated plus I should say maybe. <laughs> so, uh, there have been challenges uh, in terms of weather. Well, uh, two wheels and snow doesn't go well together. Uh, it could become very dangerous on the road. More than anything, the most dangerous thing has been the winds. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes winds were gusting around sixty-five knots. Wow. So literally my front wheel was just lifting up like it's a balloon. <laughs> it's just going up like that. So uh, there were many dangerous moments and also in Arabia, there were continuous uh, dust storms blowing at maybe thirty knots like that. Mm, I was riding a much lighter motorcycle in Arabia because there was a little off-roading to do, uh, all that and… Uh, <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, I didn't… the temperatures on the road were over fifty-four degrees centigrade. Literally my bones were melting out and uh, all the teams were exhausted, they're all falling apart. 
because of this they're just keeping on because I'm keeping on. <laughs> there were… there are many, many moments which are super dangerous. Mm -hmm. But I did this because, as I said, I've been speaking for thirty years and people have been sleeping on it. I don't uh, hold any position of authority, I'm not a minister, I'm not even a CEO or anything. The only thing I have is the love and goodwill of people. So I thought I will play with that a little bit. I just pulling at their heartstrings, putting myself to risk and it's worked that now the social media metric, leaving the WhatsApp, without the WhatsApp, it is now right now reading at 2.8 billion people have spoken about soil since March 21st. Our number is 3.6 billion is what we want. With all of you, I think we can get there <laughs> Fantastic. If that is not cause for elation, I don't know what is. So, uh, the no, last… that was the plan, so that was not the… <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, before I think we can open it to the rest of the audience, they may have something to ask. One last question I'd ask you, and this is something that all Indians want to hear, because uh, do you really think that, you know, the coming century will be India's century? Do you really believe that, you know, the next decade or two decades that we have uh, in order to take advantage of the demographic dividend of getting the youngsters to be really involved in all of this, that that will come about? And if you don't think that that could happen, what could be an action, plan of action for us to get there? See, uh, Indians have this problem, they always want a prediction <laughs> <laughs> This is an Indian problem. No, we must stop going for predictions and start evolving plans that we can execute. Those who are incapable of making a plan and executing it, always look for predictions. They are looking for the positions of the star, not knowing most of the stars that you're looking at don't even exist, they're gone long time ago. So. This uh, prediction business we must leave, is this going to be our century? Well, there are certain potentials in the country, if we can harness that, yes. As you already mentioned, one is the demographic dividend. I think we are overly exaggerating this, in my opinion, because you are looking at the numbers only in the newspapers, that this is the number of youth that we have. But you have not gone around the country and seen the condition of the youth, both physically, mentally, uh, in terms of education and other capabilities, where they are. You can easily discount fifty percent of being able to do anything worthwhile, really. I'm not being pessimistic. But even with the fifty percent, if we educate… if we have an educated, inspired and focused population of one billion people, we will be the greatest miracle on the planet, definitely. <laughs> if we… if we do that, if we leave them uneducated, unfocused, uninspired, oh, we will be the greatest disaster on the planet. So, which one will we do is in our hands. This is not subject to predictions, this is subject to our commitment, our conviction of how far we will go, each one of us and what are the actions we are willing to do, what are the comfort zones we are willing to cross and do what we have to do. Well, as a generation of people, when there is a possibility, I think we should push for the full possibility. And for all this, I'm not uh, just being uh, <laughs> uh, adamant about this, for all this, the important thing is there must be food security in the country. Mm -hmm. If three days, right. in this Mumbai city, I want you to just visualize. For three days, if forty percent of the people have not had anything to eat, do you believe you will go to your work? Hello? The civilization will collapse just like that in three days' time. It might have taken a thousand years to build it, but in three days it will collapse once there are food shortages. So we should never go in that direction, this is not new to us. Just two generations ago, we had severe famines in this country. 1942 famine took 3.2 yes. bi million people. But we have such a short memory, for sixty, seventy years we ate well and we completely forgotten. We think everything is fine, 
uh, we are dreaming how to dominate the twenty-first century, we must ensure the food security for the population. This is most important. Without that one thing, none of our plans will succeed. Yeah. So we have, I think, about uh, fifteen minutes or so. Uh, so if there are any questions, yeah. Uh, probably, you know, this mic. Yeah. Not if you have a mic. Please. My namaskar. Uh, I wanted to know what we can do as corporates. In the last twenty years, we have put up two forests, uh, one in Vikroli, Mumbai, of twenty-five acres with forty feet trees, maybe in lakhs numbers, and we took another one near Khandala, which we have built also a forest. And now we have taken fifty acres of land in Ali Park to make a forest. We are trying to do that. My question is: When you say save the soil, from the corporate's point of view. What is your recommend specifically to the corporates? We are doing this. Do you suggest anything particular about it? Or do you suggest something else that you think we as corporates can do? Hmm. Can I speak, sir, honestly? Can I frankly tell you what I… Please. Okay, please. See, this twenty-five acres of forest or fifty acres of forest or even if you make two hundred acres of forest around Mumbai, it will definitely impact the quality of life for urban population, definitely. You need to do that. I'm not saying you should not, that's very important. But it will not do any ecological service to the world. We are always misunderstanding our civic responsibility as ecological. Now plastic bags are floating around in Mumbai. This is not an ecological problem, this is a civic issue. This is a question of social irresponsibility. With a little bit of law and en strict enforcement, this will get fixed in no time. But we are trying to project that as an ecological issue. It is an ecological issue at another level, plastics, that's different. But these are all civic issues. There is not enough green cover in the city, in the urban area. This is a civic issue. If we want to live in a reasonably pleasant atmosphere, every road should be lined with trees, this is something all of us understand but we have not done. Even now it can be done in spite of all the development, it can be done. For this public transport has to increase, the number of vehicles have to come down on the road. All these things have to happen, it's all coordinated effort. For Mumbai development you can do those things. If you want, I'll sit with you one day for that, how to do this urban thing. Because right now we have made these cities, these are all old cities, did not happen in a planned way. In the morning you see or also in the evening, traffic is busy on both sides of the road. What does this mean? People who live there work here, people who live here work there. What is the point of this? We're just doing it all wrong. Most people need not get into your car every day. We can build a city like that. Oh, can we do it now? Yes, even now it can be done. Maybe not for everybody, if you do it for fifty percent of the population, your requirement of the road and how much space you need for walking, how much for space for trees, all these dynamics will change dramatically. It can be done, you are… Uh, you are in the business, building business, I will sit with you and talk about plans that I have. I propose this to Karnataka government, now to the UP government. They are all looking at it, but nobody acts upon it. There are a variety of things, but I feel corporates can act upon it, businesses can do this. I have proposed a proposal called one building city. I insist on calling it a city, a single building. Let's say you move out, if you move probably fifty kilometers, the land price could be ten percent of what it is here, am I correct? At least? Okay. You go a little further where it's ten percent <laughs> If you have fifty acres, you build one acre, anyway you have two FSI, you can bring hundred floors if you want, anywhere between fifty to hundred floors. Remaining forty-nine acres, you turn it into forest because you like that and people need it, it's very important. Residences, offices, a small school, theater, sh little shopping, everything is right there. For six days in a week, you don't have to step out of your building. If you step out, you're in a forest. If you want to use it for a little bit of organic farming that you're advising the farmers, ten, fifteen acres you can do that kind of farming. Instead of simply sitting in the car and driving for two hours, three hours a day, you could do something else. Most important thing is, today our cities are like this, especially in India, 
Mumbai, Bangalore, anywhere you see, children step out of their home, they're straight on the street. This situation of a child cannot freely run, can't climb a tree, can't fall where he wants, can't lie down where he feels like, this you will pay the price in another fifteen to twenty years, you will see the amount of psychologically disturbed people will rise in a significant way because up to twelve years of age, if you have not done those things, it will act, we will pay back, it will happen to us. So it's very important if a child steps out, there's an open space where he can run and do whatever the hell he wants. If he breaks his bone falling off a tree, it is okay. If he does… he broke nothing because he's afraid of stepping on the street, that is not a good way for a child to live. So we will have serious psychological issues in cities simply because children have not known what it means to be carefree, what it means to labor their heart in such a way that you almost felt like dying, all right? This needs to happen. Otherwise, neither physiologically nor psychologically will you be healthy, nor will you have any strength of life. Right now, you see, people are asking me during the pandemic, Sadhguru, were you cloistered in the ashram? No, I was traveling all over the world. Only thing is, I switched to the motorcycle because they said, keep social distance. So, uh, it's a simple way to keep social distance. If you ride fast enough, nobody's with you <laughs> So, I'm saying, but till now, I'm not saying I'm some kind of a superhuman being, I'm saying this is possible for every human being. I'm not… Uh, the virus has ignored me somehow. I have people, whatever you tell them, they'll come and fall all over me, they will speak straight in my face, they will breathe over me, <laughs> all this. But virus is not interested in me for some reason, okay? Uh, I'm saying, anyway the scientists are telling you, even if you allow the pandemic to run free, it will kill only twenty percent of the population. Not that we can al allow twenty percent of the population to die, that's not the point. I'm saying, why isn't the other eighty percent being affected? Shouldn't the hundred percent of population become like that? Hello? Should we not do that? For this you need strength of life. That comes only by your connection with nature, being with various things because Life on this planet is not happening exclusively, it's a phenomenon. Life on this planet does not mean your social life. Life on this planet means microbial life because they outnumber you by a trillion times. And they are the foundation of life. Without us, they can exist. Without them, we cannot exist for a moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I look to... okay. Thank you. Yeah, maybe this gentleman. Yep. <laughs> um, Sadhguru, this is more of a thought than… I, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. You said something very um, pertinent. You said um, robotics in um, agriculture. Well, you know, data sets exist today. Um, there's data from satellite information. Satellites are sending this data, which is really free. You go to ISRO website, you'll see all of this data about agriculture, about soil content, the nutrients in the soil, everything is available for free. I don't think there is a profit incentive for people to take this up and convert this into something that's robotics and AI driven. So I don't know if it's a policy issue or a profit driven or a profit issue or an incentive issue uh, in this case. See, if the policies are not favorable, you cannot make any profit. It's as simple as that. Making profit becomes impossible if the policy is not in favor of that. So policies need to think much larger and more intricately than ever before because the challenges are very different from what we would have faced a hundred years ago. Above all, the, just the population. We have four percent of the world's land and seventeen point six percent of the world's population. That's not easy to manage. If you want this to be a successful country, policy has to be super intricate. Yes. This the lady there, maybe. So uh, we have the knowledge and we have the wisdom, and you have spread it that message all across the world. Despite that, things are not happening because maybe of misgovernance or economics. We are living in an economic world. If it's profitable, as you said, people would be you know manufacturing soil also. So uh, like water on the table. So how do we get the economics involved so that 
because love, fresh air and sunlight is <laughs> free, but that somehow we just, you know, destroy it. Thank you. Um. Can I tell you a story, sir? Yes. This happened in 2060. A few scientists sought appointment with God. They got it. They went there and they told him, Hey, old man, you've done pretty well with creation. But everything that you can do, we can also do today. So it's time you retire. Are people telling you this? So, uh, God said, uh, is that so? What is it that you can do? So they dug up a little bit of soil, made a vague image of a human child and did certain things and the child came alive. God said, that's very impressive but first get your own soil. Sir, I want to tell you this, there is no replacement for soil, not on this planet, not in the known universe, there is no replacement for soil. To make one inch of topsoil, it takes six hundred to eight hundred years if there was no foot human footprint. With the human footprint, at the present level of human footprint, it will take thirteen thousand years to make one inch of soil. So don't ever think of manufacturing soil, that's never ever going to happen because it's life, it's a fundamental life. Apart from that, are the policies in the way? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm saying the same thing, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. We're addressing agricultural soil because that involves our nourishment, our economics, our survival, many things. Forests are there, we must leave forests alone. We've come to a point, the meager amount of forest that we have, first thing is we must get rid of this term, forest produce from our vocabulary. This is what we have done in the southern India with some policy changes and everything. It's taken years to get these things done. Today, most farmers are growing trees along with their crops, which has made it extremely profitable for them. Their incomes have gone up significantly. Every twelve years, when they make a partial clearing of this uh, timber that's grown, they're getting as much money as they would get if they sold their land. So every twelve years they can sell the land and keep the land. If you don't make farming that lucrative, at least if you don't make it in such a way, a farmer will earn as much as a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or whatever else is driving people into the urban, urban centers. If the farmer doesn't earn the same, in another twenty-five to thirty years you will have no farmers left. We've done some kind of a basic uh, survey, what we see is, not even two percent of the farmers want their children to become farmers. In another twenty-five years, where is the food security for this country? You have to make farm very, very lucrative, super lucrative, you have to make it. Otherwise, nobody will stay there. One simple way of doing it is that forest, what you're calling as forest produce, you can start growing on your land. If you do not know this, sandalwood, for example, there's a lot of demand for it. I'm just taking one precious uh, species. Because we were <laughs> busy tackling Virappan, all right? <laughs> Virappan was freely cutting whatever sandalwood he wants in the forest and exporting it wherever he wants. Because of him, we made a policy, nobody can grow sandalwood in their land. You cannot grow. So we are importing sandalwood from Australia, how is that? I'm saying right now, 1.25 lakh crores worth of timber we are importing in, the, in, in our country. Why can't our farmers grow it? Everything that you call as farmer, uh, forest produce can be grown on the farmland, isn't it? Right now, everybody is stuck with perishable items. They are just growing either grain or vegetable or fruit and uh, they don't have the power of scale to rule the market in any way. They are at the mercy of the marketplace. If they had multiple crops, variety of things, if they had trees, once in five years if they cut, he would have enough money to do his life the way he wants. And once there are trees on the land, he will not leave it and go to the city. It is expected by 2032, 220 million people in India will migrate to urban centers 
I think Mumbai's share should be at least thirty to forty million out of this, all the best. <laughs> you think you can build infrastructure for another forty million people in ten years' time? It'll be a mess, already it's quite a mess. A few people have managed to carve out a niche of well-being, rest are in quite a mess, isn't it? Today I was at Dharavi, well they're trying to make it spirited life out there, but that's not the way human beings should be living. Living conditions, that's not how it should be. But that is how it will become, entire cities will become like that. When there is an influx of population from somewhere, where it's not an organic growth of population, when there's an influx like this, nobody can build infrastructure for that. Yeah, we'll Sadhguru, have just uh, one more question, yeah, yeah. please. Uh, Prasunia, Namaskar. You, you're introducing yourself, Prasunia. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, uh, you know, seeing you after uh, what you described, your journey has been, uh, you don't look absolutely fresh and as if <laughs> out of, you know, the, such a, a long travel, it doesn't show at all. So, uh, congratulations and compliments on that, Sadhguru, yeah. first of all. Uh, Sadhguru, I, I know your belief in the native wisdom and you talked about leaving it to the farmers and their wisdom and, uh, you know, benefiting from it. Uh, it seems uh, sustainability is an afterthought when you say development, now we have started saying sustainable development, development which was supposed to be sustainable to begin with in a native wisdom and I have often spoken with you on that. So where uh, do you think there is a need of intervention? Shouldn't it be left? Uh, to the farmers and native wisdom to, to be, you know, protecting a land and, and soil which will organically happen if you're left alone? Mm -hmm. uh, or should the intervention of the modern science and, and, and policies uh, be there? And uh, could you throw some light on that, please? See, we've passed the time where individual wisdom could deal with the problem. We have come to a place where on an average, according to UNFAO, on an average, twenty-seven thousand species – yes, you heard it right – twenty-seven thousand species are going extinct per year. It is a slide, it's going down like this. If you allow this to continue, probably somewhere, nobody knows exactly, somewhere between twenty-five to forty years from now, what is sliding right now will go into a tumble. Once it goes into a tumble, there is really nothing we can do. We are talking about the life infrastructure which is microbial, collapsing. If that collapses, we must understand sixty percent of our body is microbial life and that will also collapse. A serious collapse of life could happen. Will it happen to everybody? Will it happen all over the world? These debates are going on. But is it even worth debating? We are heading towards a disaster. Should we think, okay, will you go to first or I go first? Is this the debate? It's a silly debate to get into. So, are we heading in that direction? Definitely we are heading. Times and calculations may be slightly off, but are we going there? Definitely we are going there. What will be the outcome of this? It is predicted by 2035 there will be dozens of civil wars in the world. This is what the World Food Program says. By 2045, we'll have forty percent less food than what we need because our populations will be 9.2 billion people and we'll be producing forty percent less, which means whole world order will go into chaos. And 2045 is not too far away. It's not another century or another millennia. No, it's right here. Many of you may live long enough to see 2045. So, can we leave this to individual wisdom, whether native or otherwise? No, you cannot. We definitely need a policy. The policy is incentive. How one revives is left to them. We produce these handbooks where techni technically what are all the things you can do? There are hundred different ways of fixing it. There is not one way. Each farmer can do it in his own way or knowledge can be disseminated how many ways you can do it. Traditional wisdom is there, but traditional wisdom is largely gone in the last one, two generations. Why I'm saying this is, we must understand when 1947 we became an independent nation, we were in the fear of famine. 
Openly, some of the British politicians at that time predicted, you just watch this country, it will go into chaos, it will go into famines, they will kill themselves. This is the end of India because we know what kind of confusion this damn country is. They have… I'm paraphrasing but they have spoken something as harsh or harsher than what I'm saying. They openly said it because they thought this country cannot go anywhere, they're going to fight among each other and uh, they will go into famines and they will die in a horrible way. But we have disproved that, we've turned this around, we created what is called as Green Revolution. What Green Revolution was, bo was born from the fear of famines. So these are emergency steps that we took, it was a bridge to cross that problem. If you get onto your bridge, you're all very proud of your ceiling kai, I believe. <laughs> Only one bridge in <laughs> Mumbai. What? You must be building hundred bridges <laughs> So, uh, if you get onto your bridge, somewhere you have to get down. If you stay on the bridge for too long, that means you're on a bridge to nowhere. This is our position. We climbed a bridge. It… did it help? Definitely. Many of us are alive today because of Green Revolution. A generation of people have eaten well because of Green Revolution. But in the process, we also damaged our soil seriously. This is not only because of Green Revolution, many other policy mistakes were made. I don't want to get into those policies or the politics behind that, leave that. We have done what we have done. But can we correct it? We can. As a generation today, we have this great challenge in front of us. At the same time, we have this tremendous privilege that we can be that generation which turned back from the brink of a disaster or we can be that generation which slept through and fell into the disaster. I'm saying this because there is a habit of walking into disasters and then grieving over it. This is unfortunate habit with humanity, we keep walking into the same things and again and again crying about the same thing. And then we will, of course, philosophers will come, they say, this is your karma, this God's will is like this, this happened, that happened. Explanations for silly things or stupid things we have done to ourselves, all right? For example, World War I happened. Everybody said, never again we should fight another war, League of Nations were formed. Within twenty-two years or twenty years' time, once again, World War II happened, more terrible than the first one, as if it's a natural progression. Since then, so many wars, so many nations wiped out, so many millions of people killed. Now we are talking about number three, as if it's a natural progression. When we do one, two, we must do three. Hello? As our capabilities and competence in what we can do enhances, if we are not conscious about what we are doing, our intelligence becomes destructive. Right now, this is a case of human intelligence turning against us. Intelligence is a solution, it's the only solution. But unfortunately, that has become the biggest problem because if all of us had the brain of an earthworm, as lot of spiritual teachers are saying, the only goal of your life is to achieve peace of mind, you would be definitely peaceful if you had the brain of an earthworm and you would also be eco-friendly. So right now the problem is your intelligence. Intelligence is a problem because we are addressing something so potent in an unconscious and compulsive way, that is a problem. So this is why Save Soil Movement is under the banner of Conscious Planet, it's not under Isha Foundation. So, so with that, uh, I think we will end today's session. Uh, Sadhguru, we take to heart your, your Save the Soil, Save Our Soil movement. We also realize that we are the generation that needs to, you know, help the world get off that bridge. I think that is a very important message that it is something that we all must do and it is our responsibility to do it. In a democratic nation, we must understand as our vote is valuable, our voice is equally valuable. I want… I request all of you to use your influence, your resources, whatever you can to keep the conversation, the soil conversation up. This is not about me, this is about soil. You must keep it up till proper policies are made. Right now, every state that I've passed through have absolutely promised that they will do it. 
But we must understand governments are not elected to do fantastic things. Governments are elected to uh, just fulfill people's mandate. Where is the mandate? You have never yes. asked for a long-term anything in the country. You ask for two percent tax benefit, you want reduction in petrol prices, you want this, this, this benefit, you're getting those things. It is time, responsible citizens, ask for lo longer-term well-being for of our nation, future well-being of our children. We must ask for that, it is time to do that. Please use your influence, resource, whatever you have to keep this conversation up. As I said, about 2.7, 2.8 billion people have spoken about it. We want at least four billion people to speak about it and keep it up for some time till policies happen globally because our state borders, our national borders mean nothing for soil and soil ecology. These are our problems that we think a uh, planet is a cake that we can cut it into pieces and take my piece and go away somewhere. You can't go away anywhere. We come from the soil, we thrive of the soil, when we die we go back to the soil. The question is only will we realize this now or only when we are buried? That's the only question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you Sadhguru and Arundhati for an engaging and insightful conversation. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a wonderful audience. Please join us for appetizers and drinks. Dinner will be served in the Malabar in the room across the hall. <laughs>